uh, and, and welcome to our meeting for those of you who've never been to one of these. So I'd like, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Luis now. Um, uh, we've worked together with Pest Tech for many, many years and they have been on the forefront of almost every IPM issue you can think of. It's been a great working relationship and uh, they came up with the idea of uh, our current approach to mosquito control in the stormwater catchment basins along with, you know, in consultation with other departments. Starting with the mountain bike uh, squad. Do you have a, did you have a name for them? Mosquito abatement couriers. <laughs> oh, okay. Mosquito abatement couriers. Uh, making the rounds of 22,000 stormwater catchment basins in the city, which is a lot. Um, and uh, so I'm really happy that you're here, here Luis. Um, and the topic is a project that he's been working on with, uh, with city agencies and with nonprofits as well. You'll talk about that. Uh, on uh, mapping out our IPM activities with uh, regard to mosquitoes. So turn it loose, turn you loose. So, um, so that's a big part of this is actually going to be correcting the record. We didn't come up with the catch basin program. There was a whole process of figuring out uh, where we should be targeting our mosquito abatement efforts so we could uh, confront this threat of West Nile virus that was coming uh, early in the 2000s. Did you come up with the mouth idea? We did come up with that. Okay. And Okay, well that was, uh, and that was, you know, they say uh, uh, the uh, mother of invention is necessity. That's what it was. Uh, we were uh, housed in a little office on Mission uh, Street in a, the back of a farmer's uh, insurance office. And uh, when we got the call to start treating 24,000 catch basins for mosquitoes, uh, we went out into the world and uh, started doing our survey and we found that you couldn't do this by a vehicle. Catch basins are obscured by, uh, you know, vehicles that are parked on the streets. And uh, so we had to do it by foot, and we found that doing it by bicycle was a more efficient way of doing it. So I want to take you through the story of that uh, right now. How did we uh, get to where we are today, where we have an ongoing treatment cycle of these catch basins, uh, and how we're applying the IPM process to it? Uh, very quickly, as always, I need to define again what IPM means to us. And uh, for me, it, uh, it's really a collaborative, data-driven decision-making process. So, and it's collaborative because we're working with a uh, multifaceted team or a multidisciplinary team uh, to uh, try to understand the problem from uh, the broadest uh, viewpoint possible and try to come up with the best strategies for uh, controlling these pests in a long-term way. So um, I want to kind of go through the IPM methodology for you uh, and I'm going to use the uh, analogy of uh, the IPM or uh, extraterrestrial invasion. Uh, this is something that comes up for me at home all the time. Uh, I know that uh, IPM as a methodology is this universal problem solving uh, tool. And uh, in business, we talk about the quality uh, cycle where you plan, you do, you check to see what happens with your actions, and then you act. You try to make it better. Uh, in Hollywood, they apply the exact same uh, IPM process to uh, dealing with these uh, IPM uh, or these extraterrestrials. So uh, many times we have a UFO come on the screen and uh, we have to start making a plan on how to deal with it. In the real world and in uh, San Francisco when it came to mosquitoes, uh, the threat was uh, from West Nile virus. Uh, West Nile virus was a, a new disease uh, that they picked up in uh, New York City for the first time in 1999. And within four years, this virus had moved across the country and made its way to California. By two, uh, 2004, within one year, uh, West Nile virus was detected in every county in California. And uh, one year later, the city and county of San Francisco uh, implemented this catch basin treatment program. And so this is uh, our team, I think in 2015, uh, mosquito abatement couriers, we call them the MAC team. And uh, there's been many iterations on what we're treating, how we're treating, and how we're recording our activities. And, uh, and that's really the, uh, the part of the evolution I want to emphasize today is the, uh, our data uh, collection and uh, reporting system that's been evolving over the years. And uh, if we get anything from this uh, talk today, my goal is that uh, collaboration really does drive continual improvement. Uh, there's really two goals in IPM. One is uh, long-term pest management, and the other one is continual improvement. And when we're improving, we want to be improving the value that our activities provide, and we want to be improving uh, the, um, the risk that our activities are posing. We want to reduce that risk. So the first step in IPM is to assemble your team. 
And uh, in Hollywood, when we're talking about extraterrestrials, usually the team is uh, military forces or special operations, and, uh, and then some uh, specialists in some field of science. Um, anytime you have biologists or linguists, mathematicians, or even astrobiologists. For us, uh, the team was uh, the Department of Public Health, the environmental health section that uh, was really the driving force uh, for uh, mounting this uh, effort for uh, mosquito management in San Francisco. Uh, but also the San Francisco PUC, who owns many of the assets that could uh, uh, create mosquito problems, and so they were uh, on the ground at the very beginning. Uh, Public Works, uh, we were hoping that uh, our partners at Public Works, the uh, hydraulics engineers, the people that are in charge of managing the uh, information systems for the infrastructure of San Francisco would be here. Uh, they've been an essential part of this whole process from the very beginning. Uh, the San Francisco Department of the Environment was part of the team at the time. They were acting as advisors, uh, checking the uh, strategies that we wanted to employ to make sure that we were choosing the uh, lowest risk, risk options to the environment. Uh, and then we uh, were on the team as well, uh, providing some consultation and, uh, and pest control activities. In San Francisco, anyone that owns property is on this IPM team for um, mosquito abatement. So uh, it's a mandate by the Department of Public Health that you do not grow vectors uh, or you do not have those sources on your properties that grow vectors. So even if you don't know it, if you own property in San Francisco, you have some responsibility when it comes uh, to mosquito IPM. So in the movies uh, and in real life, the next part of the IPM process is the inspection and survey. Uh, it's easier done in the movies where they have a war room and they can display on the screen where all the uh, extraterrestrials are located. For us, we had to have boots on the ground and go and uh, you know, visually inspect these areas. Uh, we knew that anywhere that would have water would be a likely place to, uh, where mosquitoes would be breeding. So we went and inspected uh, reservoirs at the time, uh, the land around the reservoirs. We looked at creeks. Uh, we looked at um, the water treatment plants. Uh, and the rest of the uh, water treatment infrastructure that included uh, catch basins. Uh, the next phase of the IPM process is to do identification. Uh, when you're talking about extraterrestrials, you can't really identify them. So you have to study them and you try to get your best minds to understand what those uh, extraterrestrials want. Are they friendly? Are they hostile? Uh, what do they need to live? What are they here for? Luckily for us, uh, we have lots of uh, specialists and biologists that know what uh, about these pests that we're trying to manage. So uh, we uh, aren't really just thinking about mosquitoes, we're thinking about West Nile virus. So we had to really pinpoint what are the mosquitoes that are likely to be vectoring uh, West Nile. Um, we know that birds are the reservoir hosts of West Nile virus. That means that they carry this uh, uh, virus inside of them, and they're the ones that actually moved uh, West Nile virus from uh, the East Coast to the West Coast. Uh, we wanted to focus on uh, mosquitoes that uh, feed on birds and also feed on mammals, including people. And uh, so we were able to winnow that down to uh, at least one species of mosquitoes. Um, very quickly, West Nile virus, um, it poses the highest risk to people over the age of 60, uh, uh, to children, and then to people with uh, certain medical conditions. So one out of 150 people get permanent um, uh, neurological damage from the virus, uh, and it could even result in death. Most people, four out of five people, have no symptoms, uh, however. So uh, having that understanding uh, that we needed uh, to find mosquitoes that bite birds uh, and people, uh, we were able to narrow down that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the target of our um, activities should be Culex mosquitoes. Um, Culex tarsalis uh, is a mosquito that breeds uh, mostly in uh, natural water bodies. And uh, Culex pipiens, or the house mosquito, uh, is an aggressive biting mosquito, very small, that uh, lives in uh, urban areas and prefers uh, polluted uh, artificial containers of water. So uh, uh, more than anything, this was our, our, our real target. Um, if you've ever had a mosquito at nighttime kind of buzzing around your head, uh, very pescally and you know, in your ear, that's very likely the uh, Culex pipiens mosquito, a carrier of West Nile. So the next phase of IPM is to do some monitoring. Uh, in the movies, there's usually this wait and see approach if the extraterrestrials haven't attacked yet. Uh, maybe they're friendly, so we should see what's going to happen, and we should record uh, as that's happening uh, some data. 
Uh, in San Francisco, uh, we worked with the Department of Public Health, who uh, to this day uh, responds to complaints of mosquitoes by setting out traps and trying to pinpoint the sources of those mosquitoes. At the time, uh, they did this survey uh, in the reservoirs uh, around these natural water bodies and uh, in city streets. Uh, we also did visual inspections of um, catch basins. These are assets that are maintained by the uh, Wastewater Enterprise, a division of uh, the Public Utility Commission. And uh, we were able to find that these were commonly infested with uh, Culex mosquitoes. The next step in IPM is always to uh, develop your threshold. So uh, when, it's, uh, when you're talking about uh, extraterrestrials, you might uh, take a wait and see approach until they cross the line. And that is destroying some you know, national monument of some kind. And when that happens, they're so destructive, we can't tolerate a single one. So we have to do everything we can to eliminate this uh, threat. In the real world, uh, the cost of trying to eliminate all mosquitoes from the city and county would uh, far outweigh the benefit of trying to do so. So we narrow our focus down to uh, trying to control the mosquitoes that are closely associated with uh, people that are at high risk. Uh, and, all, uh, and we found those to be the ones uh, in dense urban housing. Uh, basically, most of San Francisco uh, can house uh, mosquitoes, the Culex pipian mosquitoes that carries West Nile virus, uh, and we know that they are in those catch basins in those areas. So I think that's how we came up with the, uh, the focus of catch basin treatments on an ongoing basis. Next, we uh, have to uh, come up with a treatment plan. So always in the movies, the idea is use uh, the most powerful weapons that you have, drop an A-bomb on them, and uh, let's see what happens. Most of the time in the movies, it doesn't work. Uh, two things happen. One uh, is it does absolutely nothing, and so we have to move to another strategy. Or we get stuck in an arms race with these uh, extraterrestrials. Uh, maybe we have a short-term win, and uh, we get some control, but then they come back bigger and stronger, and we have to use bigger guns. And in the process, we end up destroying lots of our planet uh, as we're doing so. So you can imagine, now you're looking at me, Jeanette, like you know what I'm talking about. This happens in agricultural settings, too. We try to uh, control weeds by using the heavy guns, herbicides, and we get into an arms race with weeds. They adapt, create some resistance to the uh, herbicides that we're using, and so we have to either apply more herbicides or stronger herbicides to get the same control. In the real world, we always want to start with prevention. So we had to ask ourselves, is there a way to keep mosquitoes from breeding in catch basins uh, without having to treat them with a chemical all the time? And uh, the answer we came up with was no. Uh, in San Francisco, we have a combined sewer system. Uh, this sewer system uh, puts storm water uh, that um, would otherwise flood the streets uh, into the same uh, sewer pipes that uh, carry our raw sewage. So the catch basins are designed to funnel that water into the system. They're also designed to catch and hold water so they can keep gases from escaping the sewer system and they're designed to catch litter to uh, prevent it from going into the system and clogging it. If we were to try to install screens to keep adult mosquitoes from entering the system, I'm sure it would be a very costly enterprise to do so, uh, and that that screen would eventually get plugged up with debris, and it would uh, defeat the purpose of the catch basin. It wouldn't let water enter the system. So uh, we instead uh, came up with a treatment plan. The plan was uh, to treat catch basins all uh, approximately 24,000 catch basins on a regular basis, maintain those catch basins with the treatment so that when adult mosquitoes lay their eggs in those basins, uh, those eggs do not develop into adult mosquitoes. Uh, we've used various iterations of uh, larvicides for this, uh, and we use a combination of larvicides and pupicides so that we can kill late stage larvae before they emerge as adults. Um, in some cases, um, when um, we either have product failure or we have washout of the basin where the larvicides are no longer active, we have mosquito production. Uh, increasingly, uh, in the winter time, when we're not doing any mosquito abatement, uh, we see that the mosquitoes are producing in those catch basins. And, uh, and so we may be ordered to go and do a fogging with some of the products that are on the reduced risk pesticide list to knock down adult mosquitoes. Uh, we are ready, uh, in case of a public health emergency, to have to treat with a uh, residual uh, insecticide on places where adult mosquitoes may be landing 
if, uh, if the need were, were to ever arise. So we know that adult mosquitoes uh, lay their eggs in water sources. Uh, after they do that, they go and uh, spend their days uh, uh, landing on the sides of buildings protected by the wind, in trees or in bushes. Uh, it could be at some point in the future, uh, we need to escalate our actions that we would be treating those areas to treat those adult mosquitoes. But for now, that hasn't been the case. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so this is uh, fogging uh, at a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, they have some in-house um, uh, things that they have to do, housekeeping they call it, where they're flushing these systems out uh, so they're not having to treat it. Uh, every once in a while something happens and uh, we do get an outbreak of mosquitoes and so we're treating with a, um, a delta side fogger. In this case we're using uh, I think cedar side which is a um, cedar oil and uh, basically a, a silica uh, that we're blowing into the system. Uh, Essentria, uh, which is a botanical oil, also works when you're mixing that with an oil uh, to create a fog, and you can use that for, for knockdown. It's only a number of times that we've had to do uh, any fogging in the plant, a, a small number. So good IPM really requires good record keeping and analysis. Uh, that's part of the continual improvement. We don't know what's uh, working or if it's working if we're not keeping that data and then looking back and analyzing it. So uh, in the scenario of the uh, extraterrestrial invasion, uh, they did a treatment, it didn't work. Now it goes back to the scientist to say, hey, I have the data, I saw that it didn't work, and I know why it didn't work. And uh, it's because they have some defense or something else, and they actually have the evidence and the proof to say, this is a better strategy. Once they have that evidence and proof, and they communicate it back to the IPM team, they're able to get the resources they need to implement that strategy. For us, this is an ongoing conversation on record keeping. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, the greatest ideas that someone came up with from the Department of Public Health, well, I know who it was, Helen Zeverina at DPH, uh, asked us when we were doing our mosquito abatement treatments to uh, keep track of our catch basins that we treated by applying a little spot of paint on the curb. This is a very elegant, low-tech way for us to signal to ourselves that we treated that basin. We're on the blue round. Anytime there's a blue dot missing, we haven't been to it yet. Um, and it's a way to signal to the team that that was treated. Uh, the Department of Public Health is uh, tasked with the responsibility of responding to reports from the public. Uh, and so one of the things that they do is they check to see if catch basins, when they're doing their surveys, have been treated and if that treatment is working. That's just one portion of the record keeping. Um, we've gone through so many more, and that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking to you about. Uh, and then the movies, they're usually done. So they implement the strategy that was, com that, uh, was uh, identified by the scientists, the people that are keeping careful observations of these things, and uh, they pat themselves on the back until next time, because Hollywood knows that uh, if you're willing to watch the movie, you're very likely to watch the sequel. We know, however, that uh, with the same conditions, you can always expect to have the same pest problems. So we have to continue, uh, continually improve what we're doing uh, so we can do a better job next time. So, um, so now I want to talk about the data keeping and record keeping system that we've been using and uh, the evolution of this process. Uh, there's two parts of it. One is the evolution that we've had uh, working with our partners at uh, DPW, hydraulics engineers, and, uh, and then there's some outside evolution that's happening in the city and, uh, and in the government in general. So um, from the very beginning, we were working with the hydraulics engineers. And when we were tasked with treating 24,000 catch basins because of a public health emergency, uh, we really had no idea how to start. So we uh, went to them and asked if they had some maps that they could share with us of the systems uh, so we could start keeping track of it that way. Um, the collaboration, and they, you know, it's their, they will tell us that it's their job to support uh, operations and maintenance, maintenance activities of the sewer system. Uh, but we really did have a shared interest, which was uh, you know, improving the base map of that infrastructure. So the idea was if they share the map with us and we're doing this survey in the field, we could be proofing the maps that they have and hopefully give them edits to improve uh, their uh, data infrastructure. So we did our field surveys. And we crossed out and X'd out where catch basins weren't located. We drew little circles where they were located. We gave those maps back to DPW. They scanned it. And, uh, and then they, they harvested that information from those maps. 
uh, and I think we did make a big impact at the time. However, every iteration of this, we continued doing it, and we would start giving them data that was uh, less than perfect. So in, in the end, we started giving them uh, maybe more of a headache than what it was worth. So we continued trying to improve the process. The next phase of that for us was to uh, adopt GPS-enabled phones. Uh, we used the GPS phones to input uh, our findings when we went to catch basins. Uh, DPW created a backdoor to our database where they were pulling that information regularly. And I think that we were able to give them some additional edits uh, from that process. But again, uh, the GPS wasn't very good technology at the time. Uh, so it was far off and it, it only worked to a point. So uh, the next iteration of this was to uh, print maps that had serial numbers so we could keep track specifically each catch basin that we were servicing. So we could look at the conditions that were in those catch basins, uh, track the pesticides that we were using, and monitor uh, for mosquitoes at the same time. You can imagine what it would be like to do data entry 100 or 200 times a day, six digit numbers. And uh, I think that that was an incremental improvement. They, did, they were able to harvest some of that data at the time, uh, but ultimately it wasn't perfect. And uh, so we had, to, uh, we had to further improve. Uh, at this point, we pretty much had exhausted our in-house capabilities. So we brought on uh, a consultant and contractor to work with us. Uh, and uh, what he did was uh, he, he did the same process, basically, uh, which is to uh, collaborate with us to learn how a DPW does its own verification and, uh, process. He saw that they use uh, Google Street View to uh, proof things in the field. So they can sit at their computer and use Google Street View to see where uh, catch basins are or other infrastructure. And so he adopted that practice uh, by taking our maps that we had collected over several years, scanning them, built a custom tool so that they could uh, view our scanned map and find in Google Street View where the catch basins were and provide a link to that verified catch basin. So in the end, we were able to give DPW uh, a stack of data that was, uh, had a verifiable link that they could go and independently look in Google Street View. At the end of this process, uh, DPW mapped out these catch basins. Uh, this is what it looks like, uh, all the uh, edits and additions and moves that they made. And, uh, and these are the stats. Uh, by the end of it, uh, they added about 1,000 catch basins that weren't in their system. They removed about 500 uh, that they thought were uh, in their system that weren't actually there. They moved or modified some other drains based on our findings. So this represented about an 8% change to their overall database uh, of catch basins in San Francisco. At the same time, there was some uh, evolution that was happening outside of uh, this IPM team. Uh, there is this movement uh, in the country to open data uh, to build better tools to analyze that data. And this is data that uh, governments are collecting in the services that they provide so that uh, we can optimize uh, those services. Uh, in San Francisco, uh, the mayor's office opened uh, uh, an office of open data uh, precisely for that, uh, that goal, which is to uh, build uh, better tools to research and analyze what we're doing so we can optimize uh, what we're doing. The DPW uh, uh, hydraulics engineers worked with uh, SF Open Data, the Department of Technology, and uh, the nonprofit group uh, Code for San Francisco to uh, create this, um, this utility, this program called Adopt-A-Drain. Uh, are any of you familiar with the Adopt-A-Drain program that PUC has? So the idea is uh, if you're a local resident, you can uh, adopt a drain in your neighborhood uh, you can monitor that drain and you can keep it free of uh, leaf litter and clutter. Uh, so when the rains come, it doesn't get plugged up and uh, you don't have flooding in your area. So the idea is this is a social engagement with the community and giving, uh, and giving people a chance to, uh, to work with uh, city agencies directly. The big benefit to this is that uh, they created a database of, uh, of catch basins that they made open to the public. And they gave that uh, access to that database to uh, PESTIC as well. So now what we have is a continuous integration cycle with DPW. As we are doing our services for mosquito abatement, we're doing condition assessments of those catch basins. We are making edits to that, uh, those data maps. Uh, we provide that information back to DPW, who then uh, verifies it, brings it into their system, 
Uh, and they have many sources of this happening uh, throughout the city. Other contractors that are installing new catch basins or closing catch basins and removing, removing them. And, uh, and then we pull into our system uh, those fresh data maps. So uh, I don't know if this uh, is as you know, emotionally appealing to you as it is to me. This was a big deal. It took us a long time to be able to make these changes. And now we have this change happening all the time in almost a seamless way. So, uh, so what? So what is the question? Uh, we know that uh, this isn't the end of it. Things are going to continue to change. We see it happening already with uh, climate change, that the mosquito season is uh, really year round. Uh, right now, our cycles are still uh, a spring and fall cycle for treatment. It really needs to be uh, carried out into the winter as well, because uh, that's where uh, we do see activity. We know that uh, with uh, increasing temperatures, we have uh, new mosquitoes coming into California. The Aedes aegypti mosquito uh, is a mosquito from the south, a tropical species that carries new diseases like uh, dengue and chikungunya and, uh, and Zika. Uh, we've had one occurrence of those mosquitoes in uh, San Mateo County. And, uh, and recently, we had one in uh, San Joaquin. Correct me if I'm wrong, Matter, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that just happened. So uh, we do expect uh, these mosquitoes on the horizon, maybe not now, but sometime in the future. When that does happen, uh, those mosquitoes uh, are, don't need as much water as the Culex pipiens mosquito. They really need a thimble full of water. So and they can get that from divots in the pavement. Uh, they can get that from the bottom of a uh, potted plant tray. Or they can even get it from the water that accumulates in the crown of a plant. So doing surveillance for those mosquitoes is going to be a whole new world uh, when that does happen. And we know with global warming that we can expect uh, constrained resources. Uh, there's going to be many impacts in many different ways. And, uh, and we expect um, for uh, pest management to become, uh, uh, well, we hope that uh, we prioritize pest management always and we dedicate the resources we need to it that are, uh, that are necessary. So uh, after the end of all this and working with and growing our team to expand our own capabilities, uh, we uh, built a custom app uh, for um, utilizing the database that we now have access to. So uh, when we built this, uh, we knew that we needed something that was going to be easy to use and easier than the systems that we were already using that were off the shelf. Uh, some other systems that we use are PestPack uh, or uh, Esri uh, for doing field surveying. Uh, the app that we built uh, was really specific to mosquitoes and uh, was specific to the surveys that we wanted to use. Uh, it was custom built for our needs. Uh, it allowed us to be more efficient when we're doing uh, the inspections. We're no longer having to enter serial numbers, so we're able to actually gather more condition uh, data for the uh, operations and maintenance people at PUC. And um, this is one screen of what it looks like. We went from paper maps to a digital map that we have on our smartphone. Uh, when we are uh, doing our services in the city, this is what a catch basin looks like. We're able to push a button on that catch basin, which launch, launches a survey. And uh, the survey tells us the name of the catch basin or the ID number. Uh, we record uh, uh, pest monitoring information if we see larvae there or adults. Uh, we record the treatments that we're doing. And then we also do some condition information for uh, the maintenance and operation people. Uh, we try to uh, identify what are the uh, level of contents in the basin, what are the contents inside the basin. And uh, our hope is that we can close the loop on this with PUC so we can help prioritize uh, maintenance of the basins that really need it. That drives uh, mosquito abatement at the same time. We know that leaf litter is a great way to shield water from the larvicides that we're using in uh, the catch basin. So if we're able to prioritize basins that have lots of leaf litter that might, might otherwise clog and uh, keep storm water from entering the system and flooding neighborhoods, uh, we can also uh, do a better job treating them for, uh, for mosquitoes. So next steps are, is how do we harness this data? Uh, in one sense, uh, we know that if we really integrate this into our decision-making process, uh, we can do a better job of uh, preventing more mosquitoes and uh, rats as well. Uh, one of the issues that I, I know that DPH struggles with is uh, they get reports for mosquitoes. Uh, they know that we're treating catch basins, 
and, uh, and they can't identify the sources of those mosquito problems. It could be that they are the catch basins that we're treating, so it could be a, you know, a, a, an efficacy problem with the materials we're using, but it could also be some other unidentified sources. So uh, our hope is that uh, pulling information from DPH, uh, we'll be able to start narrowing down uh, other unidentified sources. Uh, earlier this year, uh, DPH gave us uh, a list of chronic uh, locations that have chronic mosquito problems. Uh, and we overlaid uh, that information with um, areas that we know that there are inactive sewer pipes. So San Francisco has been doing a sewer, a uh, pretty massive sewer replacement uh, project for several years. Uh, when they replace sewer pipe in San Francisco, they leave the old sewer pipe in place. And what they do is they plug up the ends of the pipe, they remove the manhole, Sometimes they grout the pipe completely when it's uh, now abandoned, uh, or they leave it there in case they're going to use it in the future and just cover the top. So if everything goes right, those pipes should not get water inside them. But if something doesn't happen as it's supposed to, it could be that those pipes uh, collect water, and it could be a source of unidentified mosquito problems. So we did do some survey th surveying this year. We didn't uh, find uh, any of those inactive pipes uh, having water in them, but we did find at least three sources of uh, flooded sewer systems that did have mosquitoes. So we do know that by using and connecting with uh, DPH's uh, 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 complaint data or uh, citizen reports of mosquitoes, we were able to target areas and find new areas that we had not been treating previously. So. Um, I would like to open the conversation up uh, to everyone to think about how we can connect these different sources of data together uh, to do a better job of identifying sources. But uh, just some things that come to my mind um, are, um, you know, the monitoring that many people uh, see when they're doing their activities. So uh, we've done some work with Rec and Park and uh, City Parks uh, for rats. We know that Rec and Park doesn't grow rat problems because they don't have a lot of trash on their properties. What they have is real estate. And uh, they have real estate in dense urban areas where there's not a lot of real estate. So rats like to move there, and they go next door to uh, poorly maintained trash dumpsters to feast. So, and we know that Recology, the people that are servicing those dumpsters, they see those rats. And they have the same issues when they are picking up dumpsters and they dump them into their trucks, that they end up bringing rats to Pier 96 and move those problems around. If there was a way for Recology to be into this team, uh, and to be able to report those issues directly to DPH. Uh, DPH would have another source of information to be able to, to deal with those sources. I know that, Matt, you have the same issue and you know what I'm talking about. So if there was a way to, uh, to work and send that information to DPH, uh, through that collaborative process, we should uh, be able to be more efficient in reducing these, uh, these sources of pest problems. Uh, another question I have is, can we use uh, pest monitoring data as an indicator of malfunctioning systems. Uh, a very simple way to understand that, and I know this to be the case, is when we have Norway rat burrows, uh, especially in tree wells or around structures, most of, those time, most of the time those Norway rats are directly associated with the sewer system. They are coming from the sewer system through broken lateral pipes that go from buildings to the sewers, uh, and then they, uh, they're burrowing directly in those trees uh, near those lateral pipes. So uh, we can treat as pest control operators uh, those burrows, no problem, but if we really want to deal with the source, we really have to reach those property owners and get them to fix that, uh, that broken lateral pipe. Questions that I have that I don't have the answer for uh, are, uh, are American uh, cockroaches an indication of uh, uh, improper handling of grease in restaurants? I have the suspicion that when you open up a manhole and you see lots of American cockroaches, it probably has to do with grease that's in the system. That grease is feeding cockroaches, and at the same time, it creates clogs in the sewer pipes. So perhaps American cockroaches can be an early indication of a coming crisis with a clogged sewer pipe. Same thing goes with mosquitoes. Uh, we do have a, a vector control program in, in sewers for rats. Uh, where we do find uh, sometimes mosquito activity. We're not sure where that mosquito activity is coming from. It shouldn't be, there shouldn't be standing water in a uh, sewer pipe. It should always be flowing. But could there be a leak in a sewer pipe where water is then penetrating underground, creating a source uh, for mosquitoes to, uh, to breed in? And, uh, and we know if there are leaks in sewer pipes, that's the condition for creating sinkholes 
that can cause uh, extensive damage, very costly damage. So are mosquitoes in sewer pipes an indication of a malfunctioning sewer system? That's a question that we want to answer, and we're only going to be able to do that when we have uh, better record keeping and we do that analysis over time. Um, a common question that we have, and we have this conversation, Krista, right, is are you seeing more rats this year than last? It would be great if we could actually pull that information together and we could have uh, that conversation in a real way. Uh, it's hard for me to say if I see more rats. Usually when I'm looking at rat situations, it's very, um, you know, it has to do with that specific environment. Uh, there's a filthy dumpster. Yes, I'm seeing more rats because they're not cleaning up that area. Uh, but overall in the city, it's hard for me to really uh, to make that, um, that claim. If we had uh, one place where we could pool our information together, we might be able to see these trends, and we might be able to uh, do more um, rodent control uh, to get ahead of those problems before they become a bigger issue. The other uh, big thing that I would like to start using this record keeping for, and that's really important to me, uh, is to answer the question, does construction activities or development uh, move pests around. When someone is building a new house or they're replacing that sewer pipe, does that flush rats to new locations? My uh, feeling is, anecdotally, is yes. I think that you have populations of rats in sewer pipes or you have populations of rats in abandoned buildings and when you don't control those rats, you end up moving them to new locations. Uh, what I want to do is start keeping better records of this to be able to do that analysis, to have that evidence and take it to our stakeholder group and say, if you're going to break ground, you're responsible for the rats that you're impacting. You should be doing abatement ahead of time, monitoring as you're doing it, and showing us that you didn't move rats before they become someone else's problem. So there are some platforms already established for this. Uh, these are uh, a repository of data. So 311 is a great place to report uh, uh, malfunctioning systems, to ask uh, for service, to report rats in some uh, situations. Uh, it could be uh, easier to use. In an ideal world, it would integrate with what we're already doing. So if I have uh, my new app that I can report that there is a missing grate on a catch basin, it would be ideal if that app would directly interface with 311 so that 311 can dispatch that to the people that need to know. Um, so that's the hope, is that uh, we can work together to start creating like a data potluck where we can share our, um, the data that's relevant to us in terms of asset conditions that create uh, pest problems. And, uh, and I think if we can do that by growing this team and working with new groups of people, we can have uh, a win-win in San Francisco for uh, vector control. So, um, so with that, uh, we can open it up. I do have my uh, consultant and uh, partner in uh, building this technology, Sergey, uh, that can answer some questions about the technology. Uh, and then in terms of uh, actual pesticides or frequency of services, uh, I'm, I'm able to answer those questions. And if there are just things you want to talk about and, and uh, problems that you have in me, I think this is a good time for us to have uh, those conversations uh, as well. Thank you. So I, I really love the idea of having a, a shared database that could be a tool for all the IPM coordinators who are involved in any kind of public health um, uh, activities. That, that would be such a wonderful tool. And, and I mean, I have a few questions that are probably detailed questions for later. I am curious, though, who, where all the data lives. I mean, we have the central database that came from DPW now, but what about the, like, the, what you're collecting on your app? And, yeah, and so, um, and so, forth. so we, have, uh, we have our own database uh, online, mm -hmm. uh, and DPW has a direct connection uh, with it. So it's, uh, it's like a mirrored system. They're able to pull everything that we put into it directly, and it lives with the Department of, uh, of Hydraulic uh, Engineering uh, at Public Works. So all of that data that you're, you're collecting is also mirrored over there? Correct. Oh, that's great. And okay. then they are the source of data for the PUC. So okay. everything that we collect goes to DPD or to Public Works, uh, and then they provide that information directly to PUC. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but it is my hope to directly connect with DPH the same information. So as we're seeing um, activity still in the basins, uh, I want to somehow be able to integrate integrate directly with uh, DPH so you can see it. And it could just be access to our system with a username and login, or it could be some direct link so you get it into your uh, whatever systems that you have. 
Questions? Yeah. Was that in San Mateo, or, or where was it that you were working on this again, Al? Well, it was statewide. Oh, statewide. So, um, and, and cemeteries because it's a landscaped area with lots of uh, opportunities to collect that water, right? Um, I know uh, at least Pier 96, we do work with them, and um, they try not to use water as much as they can. Uh, but you're right, anytime that you have water standing, it's a good source for mosquitoes and for rats. So that's something that we got to be on the watch out for. Uh, so it was more like a comment, though, right? It was uh, Al was saying that uh, uh, when he was working for the state uh, uh, West Nile, it, what was the agency we were working with? the California Department of Public Health, that big sources of mosquitoes were dumps and uh, cemeteries. Okay. Where is the, um, so the app right now is a pest check product. Right. And the, so there'll be questions about how that can be used, you know, by city, city workers and what the arrangement would be. Right. Uh, well, for sure, because it was a cost to develop it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it would be it could be a very low cost um, licensing to use uh, the app. This is um, this is one part of uh, better record keeping systems that we should be aware of, uh, and I want you to know. Uh, right now, we're treating catch basins for wastewater enterprise. Uh, we've been treating catch basins uh, that were on those maps, and uh, when we were using paper maps, we had no idea of knowing. Uh, really, who owned those assets. If it was a catch basin, we were treating it. Uh, in the future, now that we have access to that information, it could be that uh, that agency is no longer going to want us to treat the assets that belong to other agencies. So, um, so that's something to prepare for. Um, the good news is, is we have this easy to use tool that has these things mapped, and it would be something that you could adopt. Uh, the app is uh, super friendly in the sense that it's a, a progressive web application. So it's not something that you have to download from the uh, Apple Store or from the Android Store. It's something that you can just use online. It embeds some software onto any cell phone, and it works with, uh, on universally with any mobile uh, cell phone, smartphone. So uh, it is available for use, um, wh whoever wants it. And we can customize it for your purposes, too. So if the Department of Public Health uh, is doing inspections and needs uh, some kind of information system uh, that's different from what they're already using, uh, then there would be a way to customize it for your purposes. Is there any movement towards um, monitoring the adult population for West Nile? Uh, so the question is, is there any uh, progress in uh, monitoring adult mosquito populations? And uh, we right now have a, a program with the water treatment plants. Uh, where we are doing mosquito trapping for them, uh, but we aren't doing uh, West, Nile vi uh, West Nile virus surveillance. So I guess the question goes to DPH. And that's, uh, yeah. If, if we go that route, we would most likely request service from uh, San Mateo County because it has a lot of experience. With it. I mean, if you've got West Nile positive mosquitoes in a given area, I mean, what do you, what do, you need to do other than that? 
Uh, how many times have um, West Nile virus positive birds been found in San Francisco? And how many times have human uh, acquired uh, infections been confirmed? So it could be that the bird acquired it outside of San Francisco? Yeah. Very likely. They fly still, you know. mm -hmm. Makes sense. So you were asking me uh, before the meeting, Natter, what uh, materials we're using to treat uh, catch basins? Well, I and think what you, you have an idea of what you're using. And uh, you know, we're running low on PCI right now. It's time for us to reorder. So uh, you know, we were probably like to uh, have some of the Yeah, so, we, um, so we've uh, used different products over the years based on um, the frequency of service that we were providing. When we uh, had more frequent service to catch basins, we were using microbial larvicides. Um, and we started out with BTI. Uh, we were concerned about the same uh, resistance uh, problem. So we moved to uh, Vectomax, which is a, a combination of BTI and Bacillus spherichus. Uh, and it's supposed to give you uh, up to six weeks control um, we think it's more like uh, three or four weeks that it lasts inside the system. Uh, right now we're using AltoSeed um, uh, XR ingots. These are a, uh, basically it's a plaster of Paris ingot that's treated with an insect growth regulator. Uh, the label says it can last up to 150 days. Uh, we found it to be uh, less than that. Our uh, distributors are telling us uh, you shouldn't count more than three months. Uh, I think there's questions of if it even lasts the three months uh, that we're counting on right now. So uh, the next phase of evaluation for us is really going to be uh, testing the efficacy of that product in those catch basins. I just sent you a protocol for doing that uh, this morning. But I think that the way you do it is uh, you open up the catch basin, you dip cup sample, you find uh, uh, immature stages of larva, um, and, uh, and you look for cast skins of pupa. So uh, if the pupa have emerged uh, and left their exoskeletons in the water, then it tells you it didn't prevent them from becoming adult mosquitoes. That's probably the best way. Yeah, and so that's going to be a pretty intensive uh, uh, thing to do. So we have to really develop a protocol, and I'm going to count on your help to help me <laughs> develop a statistically significant protocol to sample catch basins and uh, test the, uh, the efficacy of the product. And so I think any time that we go to a catch basin and we see uh, adult mosquitoes you know, flying out of the basin, we should consider that a treatment failure uh, and do additional treatment. We're also using a mineral oil called uh, BVA oil. It's uh, for, to, for pupicide. So um, uh, the uh, IGR and microbials do not kill late stage larva. Uh, and so you have to have something for those late stage larva to keep them from emerging as adults. And that's that mineral oil. Uh, here's, here's a refuse skin. Yeah. We have chronic rash problems, things like that. So um, we could do anything. Uh, always, since we're contractors, we always have to follow a very specific line, which is uh, serving you know, the client and the contract that we have. Sure. 
So that might be uh, going beyond what we can do uh, with that app. Uh, but we do have the capability of adding catch basins to it. And we are looking for other features that uh, pose a uh, health and safety risk. One of those things would be um, um, basins that have grates installed parallel to the curve, uh, that, uh, to the curb, that uh, poses a risk for bikers where their tires can get wedged in the, in the catch basin grate. So we are rep reporting those things. There are some other features like uh, wash-ins, which are cuts in the curb that allow water to get into the basin. In some cases, in some cases the contractors that were installing wash-ins uh, you know, weren't installing the catch basin. And so uh, we're helping to identify those uh, situations too uh, for these operations and maintenance people. Uh, we are doing uh, treatment of uh, sewers. And in those cases, we are collecting information of mosquito uh, activity as well. And that's something that we really want to uh, continue synchronizing with a DPH. Um, getting back to the catch basin, do you what is your pool of uh, debris or there debris from which potentially coming out of them? Do you mark anything? Do you yes. So uh, so yeah, that is uh, that is the condition assessment that we're doing. So uh, and that information is getting back to PUC. And our hope is, and in a perfect world, uh, we'd be able to prioritize conditions that are severe uh, and even be able to generate a work order in their system for uh, prioritizing those catch basins. So that's the next step in working with the hydraulics engineers is doing that. And the big one that we're worried about is any raft that sits on top of the water. So leaf litter is a really big problem because we're using an ingot and that needs to touch the water to, uh, to really uh, deliver the, the pesticide there. Yeah. So and the leaf litter blocks it. Matt? Uh, how do you determine when to use the middle of a hydraulic If you have pupa? So um, right now, uh, everything that we're doing is uh, looking inside the basin. So if um, we expect to see larval activity in the basin when we're using uh, the methoprene, the altocyte ingots, uh, we are treating with pupa pupa side anytime we see adult mosquitoes come from the basin. So that's basically our, our, our trigger, is if there's adult mosquitoes, we do an additional treatment. Uh, we, we're exploring how to equip bikes with cans of oil, and uh, that didn't really fly. Uh, the PPE requirements are so high that it would uh, be a huge burden for them to, um, to ride around uh, and treat with an oil uh, pupa side. So we have a truck that follows up behind them. The app tells us any basin that they act, uh, they mark down as uh, being active with adults, and we have a team that follows weekly behind the catch basin team treating with that, larva, uh, that pupa side. What efforts are being made to allow DPH to access those maps and that information? Uh, I guess this is the starting point. Okay. So we just, um, we just finalized, well, we launched this in July. And, uh, and so we've been using this probably since uh, the first week of July. Uh, so we don't even have a complete round through the city yet, but uh, it's yours. So DPW has a direct link to us uh, to view these things. Uh, this is the city and county's uh, data, because this is the city and county's program. And so um, I can give that to you today if you want and uh, for you to use it. And same thing goes with Record Park. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, so right now, uh, the contract is set up to do two cycles a year. So we have a spring cycle and a fall cycle. And uh, we start, uh, we used to start February 15th. Uh, we're starting a little bit later now, uh, uh, having to do with the, the resources that we have. And, uh, and so we are basically doing two cycles a year. We uh, did uh, speed up a little bit, I think because of the app. Uh, so I hope to be able to negotiate something with uh, PUC to at least go back and target basins that uh, had water on this last round so we can maintain some of this larvicide there over the winter. So uh, that's my hope, and I, I hope that now armed with the evidence and the data and the maps to show it, that, that they'll go for it. Go ahead, Natter.
That's a good one. And um, we know we, at one point we had armed our group with uh, like tent poles so they could be probing the basin. Uh, that was very difficult for us to do. Right now, um, in the springtime, we treat every single basin. So every basin that uh, looks dry to us does get a treatment uh, at least once a year. Uh, on our second round, we're only treating basins that have standing water in them. So uh, when we do drop the ingot in there, if we see we disturb the water, uh, or we disturb it and we see things coming out, we go back and we treat it with a pupicide. Otherwise, we're testing it by basically kicking uh, debris in from the street into the basin and trying to stir things up that way to see if there's something else going under, underneath that litter. And possibly underneath the cat basin itself. Because there could be a cat somewhere where there's underlying water. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the deeper part of this. So I think that's where we're going to have to really be able to show uh, where you have uh, this evidence of chronic mosquito problems, where we're doing uh, the catch basins, where we can demonstrate that we're actually treating the basins and not producing mosquitoes there, and we still have an issue with adult mosquitoes, that's where uh, we're going to need this data to support additional uh, work. And one uh, good question, you said that you thought there was potential to that. We had done that for a, a, like a pilot. Catch basins are filthy places, and uh, and our team are you know the they're working on bikes, so uh, it's a matter of uh, a heavier load that they're carrying, and then also the contamination that they have uh, from handling such filthy materials. So uh, that was really the issue for us. Uh, we 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 piloted it, and all the temples came back broken, and uh, and I think you know no one wanted to use them is what it was. No. No. Yeah, so, so uh, I did mention that, but let me, uh, let me review it. You it's sewer no. vapor. Exactly. So it's acting as a trap. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. So when it's functioning, it should have water in it. Okay. Now, there are new systems that they're installing. These are uh, they're called MS4s. It's the municipal separate stormwater system. I can't remember what the... Four S's are. <laughs> but anyway, those uh, directly drain to the bay, or they drain to some other body of water, so they don't actually hold the water. But in some cases, we found that those do get clogged as well, and we have found that they can be a source of mosquitoes. So uh, even though now we're not actively targeting those uh, MS4s, um, we may need to at some point, because there is maintenance that has to happen on them as well. Roberto. Yeah, Into the, into the catch basin itself? Yeah, or into a main that are on the street. I mean, to use a snake with a camera and just see what you see inside. I can't up to this point. Um, you know, I can't. Um, but that's why we have this team. So uh, working with uh, the, the Public Works uh, hydraulics engineers, we've had these suspicions. They have records of many of the lines being inspected, and they have photos of those lines. And in some cases, they've been able to show us that there's cracks in different systems that were identified previously. So, uh, so the answer is yes, uh, but really it's about uh, the right folks doing that work. Uh, you know, I'm just curious. I, how, many, how much reporting of places where you know you dropped an inlet, in, an ingot in there, where then you went back because a month later you got reporting of, uh, you know, adult mosquitoes coming. Yeah, I can't, I can't answer the question. So right now we're, we're just, uh, we have this, uh, this, this system that we're using. We have our first round right now. We haven't had any uh, rain uh, since we've been using it. So I hope by uh, next year we'll have a better uh, so you, idea of that. This will be the first fall application that you're doing? Using this. Using an ingot. And using this record keeping system at the same time, where we can visualize these things and we can track that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, March through October 30th has been historically no water at that time. Right. Yeah, and that, and that was kind of the, uh, 
you know, the suggestion is, why don't we just wait till all the, the rain is gone? And you just don't know when it's going to rain and when it's not going to rain, and you, you have to get started sooner than later. If we were to wait until, uh, you know, April to start uh, treating, we wouldn't get through the city until uh, July. And at that point, we would have a lot, I think, a lot more mosquitoes in the places that we haven't been yet. So I think there is an argument for starting sooner than later. You had a question, Matt? So um, that's part of the difficulty in this. They can even look the same, the catch basins, when you're looking down at it, but um, inside they may be different. So a typical catch basin with the D shape uh, will have a, an inverted kind of bell inside of it. That's the trap. Uh, those should have water in them. Uh, and they're designed to hold water and to serve as a, a trap or a seal from sewer gases. Uh, there are other basins, like you mentioned too, that have direct inlets and outlets. So they, they basically just pass the water through. Uh, and then there's these uh, MS4 basins that drain directly to uh, the bay or to other bodies of water. I think the terminology is, you know, it's, it's a little misleading. Using okay. the same term for everything. Catch basin. So like a catch basin is anything that will retain. So if you have a, the pipe could be an inch or two above. And so you will have water at the bottom. It's designed to collect the sediment in the bottom there. So not until now that we can actually see the, uh, the name of the basin on the app, see the uh, ID number, can we identify it. Otherwise, we're just looking down at it, and they look from the surface uh, to be virtually the same. Right. Yeah. And as you do it on a bigger scale, then it's going to be impossible to keep track of it, right? Just on paper. And I was kind of thinking of your rat traps, too, because you have a lot of, a lot of those around. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something you could envision? Well, we sort of integrate test traps. We'll, we'll do them just to launch that. So okay. We're using that technology to grab the data. So if you hold this, you know, you see uh, a little test for help. So we use PestPack also, and so we're looking at uh, bridging to it. So uh, it does have, uh, it's called an API. Um, what's API stand for? It's application programming interface. programming interface. So it's a bridge. And so you're able to connect different systems together. Uh, PestPack doesn't have everything that we want, uh, like recording photos of conditions that you're finding. Uh, and, or alerts to remind you that you have something open in an area that you have to go and uh, address it. So uh, our hope right now is not to build a new pest pack, but it's to uh, build the capabilities that pest pack is missing and bridge to it. So we still have our work order system in pest pack, but we have a better way to do uh, monitoring uh, using a custom built tool. So maybe this is kind of a techie question for you all, but um, with, with an API like Yeah, right. 
and, uh, and uh, Department of Technology and Hydraulics Engineering, they're trying to, to build systems that uh, other departments can use too, uh, including an ESRI database or... Exactly. Mm -hmm. So we did invite a different group that was supposed to be here, right? And uh, there's a project that we have coming up uh, with a, a nonprofit group called Dev Mission. So and their mission is to uh, bring uh, local residents, uh, young adults, uh, into the tech industry. And uh, the idea is uh, to try to, um, through technology, uh, build some custom tools that serve uh, the local area with local problems that we have. So they were going to be here. Uh, this is going to be uh, some, a group that's going to be um, working in our offices and learning about what we're doing so they can come up with some projects. So if you have uh, some issues that you think technology could be a solution for, that could be a resource for you. Uh, and this would be something that uh, uh, would not cost you anything to, to do. And I think that they'd be interested in, in developing it for you. So keep that in mind. And if you have something, please let us know. Jeanette? Is there a possible percentage of the trains that are getting treatment that could utilize graphics that do allow water to pass or do, I mean, is it reasonable? I think we have to 
find out. I, mean, I, I don't have the answer for it. I mean, we've talked about it, and uh, you would see it in construction sites. They use that for erosion control, right? So you're using them? Okay. I mean, in what instance do you use it? I, just to well, be helpful. There are drains that we have that the engineers don't have to do a lot of cleanup, and so there's not a lot of water for us to do it. But yet, we do have or have had larval activity. Okay. So after treatment of the larva, then the cancer goes on, then no more treatment is ever needed. Mm -hmm. So the question was, can you, is there an application for screening or blanketing the catch basins to keep mosquitoes out but still let water in? And, uh, and you're describing an instance where you have a small number of basins that you can do that. So I think that for property owners and that are doing that, uh, that's totally viable. And the proof is in your, uh, your experience with it, right? right. Uh, Um, I can't answer the question. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's 24,000 basins. Like we have one in the middle of the driveway. We're right beside Manor. Uh-huh. That would be an ideal blanketing issue. But I don't blanket it because it doesn't make it. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, if it's blanketed, then we wouldn't check it. I mean, next time. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know what the, um, the I mean, cost the outlay is for doing that. that it could be applied, it hasn't gone to that yeah. Yet. Right. Natter? Yeah, once you've got a unique effect on one of those catch basins, and uh, this comes from uh, information that I got, I believe, last week where we're doing surveillance. Uh, in base of the eight stood there from the fire station down. Uh, if there's a catch basin that was covered with a construction cloth, but there's a, like one little corner that was open. So would the cost outweigh the benefit? I, get, I mean, that's the question you got to ask, right? You'd still have to monitor it. And so in which case, the additional cost, is it warranted versus just treating it? Um, I'm not sure. And to do that on scale would be the question. Right. Yeah, and I think on a smaller scale, that, that would work. But a citywide would be difficult. Yeah, just targeted. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then it wouldn't work over the ones that do have water in them as filters. So those don't get blanketed. We'll have to think about it. How long does it take to put blanket on? So there's the gray. <laughs> okay, so it takes some time. Yeah. So that's an average then, consideration too. Yeah, and it, it takes two people because once you start to slide the gray over, I was sort of thinking of some of those chronic areas where we always get falls. But in that Maybe situation, the more is more. Because the more we draw the leaves around the edge, the less is going to fall in over the years. Yeah, we're actually looking at ways of how can we uh, dip cup sample without removing the grate. Because that's such a, there's a risk, you know, of injury. Oh, that's easy. How? Turkey baster. Turkey baster? Mm -hmm. You just got a really long one, right? And then there's some technique to dip cup sampling too. And so I don't know, you'd have to. Do it enough to really test to see if you're getting. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> IPM innovation. Okay.
I'd love to go on a field trip with you and, and, and see it in action, really, because that sounds like a good idea on checking uh, larval activity. And then it's hard to know the difference, right, if it's uh, treated larva or not. And a very strong flashlight, I'm sure. Uh, flashlight, but you know, we have these metal clipboards. Okay. Like and mirror. Like the sun. Okay. It's a lot more powerful than a flashlight. Yeah. Okay. You can handle it right, and you're out there at the right time of day. Cool. You know. Otherwise, getting out there around uh, 11, 12, noon, uh, you know, 1 o'clock where the sun is overhead. Okay. Uh, we've been able to see it looks like that. Good tips. Thank you. Well, um, I think okay. we're out of time. All right. Thank you.